Welcome back to the GPS journey. Right now, we are really at the core of understanding GPS. The first snippet in this module two wrote mathematical expressions for the pseudo-range measurements. The pseudo-range measurements are the essential ingredient of GPS. Recall that they're inclusive of the range, the true range from the satellite to the user, as well as a time offset due to the difference in the inexpensive receiver used in the user equipment and the very expensive satellite clocks uh, used uh, up on orbit. We took those equations and we included the error sources, and we'll have much more to say about that today and next time. The other thing that we noted about them is that they included the square root operation and the square operation. So both of those go beyond linear sets of equations. And so we spent quite a bit of time, uh, and hopefully worthwhile, on how to linearize those equations. Once linearized, we went ahead and wrote expressions for how to invert the measurements so that you can go ahead and estimate the things that you really care about, your x, y, z location, as well as the clock offset. Or alternatively, if you used east, north, up, reference frame, your location in east-west, your location in north-south, your location above uh, the Earth's surface, your altitude, as well as the clock offset. So either way, those linearized navigation equations can be written. They're very important. Today, we're going to use those same linearized navigation equations and ask and answer the question, how well does GPS work? Now, of course, we know from our day-to-day -day experience that it gives you about 5-meter accuracy, 10-meter accuracy, something along those lines, depending on your environment as well as the quality of your receiver. So in this snippet, we're going to dig into a thing called the dilution of precision. The dilution of precision is very, very central notion to GPS as well as other navigation systems. It connects the quality of the pseudo-range measurements through to the quality of the east, north, up estimates. So it takes something that describes how good the measurement is and tells you how good the quality of the end product, the position fix is. To do this, we'll need to invoke a little bit of theory from probability. And what you see in front of you there, the black curve, is the so-called probability density function. And so the PDF, the abbreviation that we use is this curve right here. And so I've tried to give it the shape of a traditional bell curve or Gaussian cur curve or normal curve. And as you look at that curve, it gives you the density of the probability that some variable, some random variable x, falls in a little window. And so that little window is shown over there on the left. And notice that that window has width delta x. So let's say that x describes the error in one of the pseudo-range measurements. And then when we look at this little window here and say, well, what's the probability, what's the likelihood that that measurement error will be within, let's say, plus or minus 20 centimeters of some specific error value x3. And the value of the probability density function is that when you take p sub x evaluated at x3 and you multiply it by the width of that little window, which I'll fill in right now, that product, p evaluated at x3, times that width delta x is the probability that the error falls within delta x of x3. And that's why we call it the probability density function. You need to multiply it by the width to get a meaningful probability. Now, in nature, certainly in GPS, it's very rare to have the whole probability density function. We would like it. We would be happy for it. Sometimes we assume that we know it. But uh, generally, that's pretty speculative. So we content ourselves with a much more rough description of how the errors are distributed. 
And the characteristic that we use over and over again in GPS is just this measure of the breadth of the PDF. And that's known as either the standard deviation, which is shown here, sigma of x, or that value squared is the variance, the expected value of x squared. And what the variance tells you is what's the expected value of x to be spread, dispersed away from the mean, or in this case, the mode of the distribution. And so we have the expression there. I won't drag you through it. Suffice it to say that in GPS, almost all the time, we assume that the errors have zero mean and that they're fully characterized, that all of our cares are captured by this measure of the breadth. And so we will be concerned with coming up with a value of either sigma x or sigma x squared, either the standard deviation or the variance, both for the measurements, the pseudo-range measurements, how big are the errors in those measurements, and how do they map into the variance of the errors, let's say, in east, north, and up. That mapping is the dilution of precision, the DOP. And so please uh, appreciate the value of both ends of this, the side which describes how good are the measurements, the dilution of precision, which you use to multiply times the sigma that describes the pseudo-range measurement, and end up with an estimate of the standard deviation of the error in east, the error in north, the error in up, and the error in the clock offset. Fortunately, that mapping, uh, in, in, with certain assumptions and certain approximations is entirely given by that G matrix that we talked about earlier. So we love that geometry matrix, not only because it tells us how to process the measurements to get our best estimates of X, Y, Z, and time. It also, when multiplied in this fashion that you see here, G transpose times G, that quantity inverted tells us how strongly the pseudo-range measurement errors map into or amplify into errors in X, Y, Z, and T. So on the left here, we have posed the question, please give us the variance of X minus X hat. In other words, give us the variance of the error in our estimate of X. The second one is the variance in our error in our estimate of Y. X hat and Y hat being the estimates, X and Y without the hats being the true values of X and Y. Similarly, here it is for Z, and here it is for the clock offset down at the bottom. Those variances are normalized and appear along the diagonal of this matrix G transpose G inverse. So bear in mind that this matrix will be four by four. So all kinds of other numbers appear out here in this region. All kinds of other numbers appear here in this region. But if you're using the G matrix, which is tied to the Earth-centered, Earth-fixed frame, and look along the diagonal, we call this element the one comma one element first row, first column. We call this the two comma two, second row, second column, three comma three, and four comma four. And if you look at those values, you can see the thing that we seek, the error in the quality of x, normalized by the measurement variance of the pseudo range. So one of the assumptions that's made to develop this kind of approximation is that all of the pseudo-ranges have equal area, equal variance associated with their errors. And so we can use a single sigma tau squared shown appearing here in all four of these expressions. So we ignore the possibility that one satellite might have a stronger signal and therefore a smaller variance. We just assume that they're all about the same. 
And so a typical value there might be one meter to four meters. We'll talk more about what value to put into sigma tau later on. But <clears throat> once you have sigma tau, you can then just calculate this matrix and multiply sigma tau squared times this value, which has the name x-dop. We'll come to that in a second. And you'll get an approximation of the variance in the error in x. And so since the 1 comma 1 element is tied to x, we call this scaling factor the x dilution of precision. It is that number that dilutes the precision of the range measurement to give you an estimate of the area error in x. Similarly, y dop, z dop, t dop. Next view graph gives the same kind of analysis. The only thing that we've really shifted here is that rather than using g, which is the earth-centered, earth-fixed reference frame, we've gone to g tilde. And now, when we've made that transformation to errors, uh, or estimates and errors in east, north, vertical, and time, we can look at the same diagonal elements, and rather than giving the dilution of precision that maps from range error to x, y, z, we get the dilution of precision that measures from maps from range error to error in east, error in north, error in vertical, and error in time. So that's the power of this concept, dilution of precision. Here it is depicted. Uh, I, I love this uh, sketch. <clears throat> it's often true that you can manipulate matrices and come up with all kinds of powerful results. The power of those results is always multiplied. The value is always increased if at the same time you can make a sketch which at least in two dimensions explains to you what's going on. So let's try and understand more deeply what's really being captured in dilution of precision. So consider these two situations, left and right. In left, we have a user located somewhere in this area or this area. And notice that they enjoy signals from two satellites. And those two satellites are spread very widely in the sky compared to the user locations. Over here on the right, we have a user, let's say, in that area there. And as they look skyward or towards the satellite, the satellites are closer to each other. Now, I think you're immediately suspect that the situation on the left is better. The condition number of the G matrix will be better. The rows associated and captured in that G matrix are more nearly independent. And your intuition is correct, because what we see here is that for each satellite, the range measurement is approximately into the middle of the two concentric circles that enclose each one of those satellites. And we've included a band here of error. And the width of that band is an approximation of sigma tau. And so notice that in all four cases, for all four satellites, we have drawn that sigma tau to be just about as equal as I could make it using PowerPoint. That sigma tau, taken together with the sigma tau of this other satellite, intersect and create these green regions that I've shown, which means that as we look at it from the position domain, the two range errors have worked together to create these error areas. And the error areas on the left are smaller than the more elongated area areas, error areas on the right. So the situation on the left enjoys better GDOP. Those multipliers along the diagonal element of the G transpose G inverse matrices that we defined on the last two view graphs will be smaller. It's as simple as that. That's what G dop is. 
In the extreme, as these two satellites come all the way together, let's say, then if you spend some time looking at that drawing, that error area becomes very large indeed. And so you want small geometric dilution of precision. You don't want a large multiplier associated, associated with sigma tau. You want a small multiplier. The matrices have ca captured that concept mathematically, and hopefully this drawing has captured that uh, concept more intuitively. You may ask, what's the utility of dilution of precision? What do we use it for? The first, shall we say, uh, use of dilution of precision was used for designing the original constellations of satellites for GPS, for the Russian system, GLONASS, the European system, and so forth. And the wish was to guarantee that a user anywhere on the surface of the Earth at any time of day would enjoy reasonably small dilution of precision. So that object function, that objective, was applied to constellation design. The number of satellites were, were varied. The number of orbital planes were varied. The number of satellites per orbital plane were varied. The phasing of the satellites in the orbital planes were varied until they came up with constellations which were robust in that sense. They gave uniformly small dilution of precision. Dilution of precision is also used in any number of error analyses. And you might think, well, don't you only have to do that analysis once and you've understood the performance of the constellation? But it's more complicated than that. For an aircraft, let's say, when it banks, it blocks some of the satellites in the sky. And so that G transpose G inverse matrix and the associated DOPS have to be calculated again. If you're in an urban canyon, in downtown San Francisco with the skyscrapers on both of you, you also suffer from satellites that are blocked. From time to time, the constellations lose one or two satellites. And so then your G transpose G inverse matrix uh, changes again. This an error, error analysis can go on offline when we're simply trying to anticipate those situations. But it also goes on in real time. As the user equipment is being used, it's constantly assessing the DOPS. And most GPS receivers will provide to you an estimate of how good your performance is in east, north, up, and clock. And finally, certainly in satellites, satellite receivers early on, uh, DOP was also used to select which satellites you should use. Uh, the receivers were not computationally capable of tracking all the satellites in view, so there was a down selection to let's pick the four best, the five best, whatever it was, and that down selection was controlled by DOP as well. So when we return next time, we'll come to uh, another way of understanding and characterizing the GPS errors. This is called GPS error budgets. I look forward to seeing you then. Thank you.